Welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here to be part of this uh, event. Before we start our conversation, I just want to say a word about the way that we use the word writer. It's interesting. Sylvia Platt was a writer. Joan Gideon is a writer. David Foster Wallace was a writer. Zadie Smith is a writer. They're all people whose profession requires them to put words together into sentences and then put sentences together into some larger unit and give a picture of the world. And the materials are very flimsy, nothing but words, but they're enormously powerful. But by that account, uh, the anthropologist Mary Douglas was also a writer. Uh, Alistair McIntyre is a writer. Charles Taylor is a writer. And so, especially, uh, Jean Beth Yelstein is a writer. And well, we sometimes miss, I think, the commonality. It's not that they're doing exactly the same thing. They work with different conventions. They work in different professional environments. But there's a deep commonality between what someone like Joan Gideon or David Foster Wallace does or did and what someone like uh, Mary Douglas or McIntyre or Taylor or Jean does in her work. And so this is the going to be the uh, condensed equivalent of the Paris Review interview with Jean Becky Austin uh, about uh, her work as a writer. And I'm going to start, Jean, by asking you, uh, what were some of the books that you read as a child, as an adolescent, that were formative for you? Um, well, there were lots of uh, you know, children's books, the names of which I'm, I've forgotten. And the first one I remember was about a little fat flounder that lived at the bottom of the sea. But I've forgotten the title of that, and it's probably uh, in a dustbin somewhere. Um, but I really uh, started picking my own books, so to speak. Um, when I got to be 10 or 11 and so on. And my first big enthusiasm was for mystery, and I read through all the Nancy Drew series um, and thought that was terrific. And uh, then I, uh, every other week, uh, went to the bookmobile. We didn't have a library in the village, um, so the bookmobile drove out every two weeks from the Larmer County uh, public library uh, with some books on its shelf and you can pick them out and the fellow who drove the bookmobile realized I, I like to read so he let me check out to double the legal limit um, and I found that I was reading a lot of <clears throat> biography that, um, that that grabbed my interest to read about um, uh, famous people and how they got to be that way so I read uh, Gandhi's <clears throat> autobiography, My Experiments with Truth, when I was 12 or 13, I think. Um, I read uh, Dwight Eisenhower's book about World War II, Crusade in Europe, um, when I was about the same age. Um, got interested in war, read uh, Ernie Pyle's War Dispatches. Um, and then when I started to really read fiction, um, well, I had always read fiction, but when I started to focus on it, <clears throat> um, Willa Cather was one of my great, great favorites, still is, um, especially My Antonia, which is a book I dearly love um, and try to uh, read every year, uh, go through every year. Um, I, uh, Hemingway is uh, a writer that I much admired and wanted to write like Hemingway, which is to write in a spare, lean way, because I recognize my tendency toward the prolix, you know, to long, complicated sentences and, and big words, so I uh, would try to think in Hemingway-esque ways, 
to uh, you know, chase in that temptation. Um, so those are some of the, the early uh, the early people that I that I um, looked at. Um, you know, I remember reading Ethan Frome, uh, the, the novel Ethan Frome, and being uh, uh, quite, I don't know what to call it, taken aback that you could capture so much um, pathos and intensity uh, and twisted love uh, in such a short, in such a tiny book, you know, little book. Um, so my idea when I was a teenager was uh, that I, I wanted to be a writer, that writing is what I really wanted to do. Um, when I got into, this jumps ahead a bit, but I'll say it now, uh, when I got into college, um, I decided that one of the, uh, it wasn't an official goal of college, but an unintended consequence was to make people poorer writers. Um, I think that most, let's face it, most academic writing is not very really good as writing. Um, it, it may do the job in a kind of workmanlike way, but the prose is not particularly compelling. Uh, many of the word scenes are dead. Um, and I know I didn't want to write like that, but it, that continued, you know, into, into uh, graduate school where I, I was constantly fighting against the way uh, people around me were writing and um, the books that I was reading, um, you know, the, way, the ways in which they were written. I like reading the old, the old books, you know, because they were, uh, the books we were studying you know, they were, the, the author was not under the same constraint as the contemporary person studying him or studying her. Um, I should add that, um, I was going to mention this later, but I'll mention it now, that someone I discovered when I was a teenager and fell in love with and have never fallen out of love with was Albert Camus. Um, and even in translation, his writing is so beautiful. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's fair, but it's lyrical at the same time. And that's, that's a real accomplishment, I think, to be able to do that and for it not to seem just so clipped and severe. So I really care about the way words are put, put together. Well, that's, that's clear, uh, much to our, uh, our benefit. When did you discover um, Augustine? When did you start reading Augustine? Um, I started reading Augustine when I was uh, an undergraduate, just on my own. I, I, I think we were assigned in one course I took on the history of early Christianity, because I was a history major, not politics. Um, some excerpts from the Confessions of Memory Service. Um, so I went out and got my own uh, Confessions, but it was a foreshortened version. <coughs> It was not the big fat old thing. Um, so I graduated myself to the big fat old thing at one point, in both, both confessions and then the city of God. Although I, I never studied Augustine in any class, um, but I did start reading him and, and didn't stop. And another thing characteristic of Augustine, John, and I'm sure that's why you question here, is that he's a brilliant writer, absolutely brilliant writer. And, with great, great narrative power. Um, and that, that has a you know, strong appeal for me. Um, one of the things that Flannery O'Connor says in an essay is that um, you, know, you, you shouldn't be a writer if you, if you want to be grand. That writers have to care about the little things. Um, and if you want everything to be majestic at every moment, and cast at this, this grand level, then writing is not for you. It's, it's, uh, it's she said, it's, it's too humble a task for you, obviously. You do something, you should not be a writer. That reminds me of um, something I wanted to ask you about uh, style. That style is a notion that contains within it two uh, 
fields of thought that are somewhat in tension. On the one hand, style connects somewhat with what we think of when we talk about taste, mm -hmm. um, subjectivity, uh, so that we, we often talk about style in terms of fashion. Yes. And, um, and on the other hand, um, there's a strongly moral dimension to style, and I'm sure you've noticed, and I'm sure everyone uh, in this room has had the experience of having a strong reaction to a style that you uh, objected to, uh, and you didn't just object to it the way that you might not like a particular flavor of ice cream, which is just a matter of taste, but uh, in some way or another, there's a moral element yeah. to that. And so those two are intention, but they're both part of yeah. the style. In your own style, which clearly began to form before you ever thought about it. But, yes. But what, um, what is your own sense of your style and especially the, the, the moral dimension of it? Um, well, the way you cast the question uh, puts me in mind of a, a book. I mean, my, my style was already mostly formed, I suppose, by the time I read this book, but uh, a book that, that didn't get a whole lot of attention, and the author died uh, unexpectedly rather young. A uh, fellow named Julius Covesi, and it's a book called Moral Notions. And he distinguishes between um, describing from a moral point of view and other ways of describing. That is, it's not just one way of describing something. Um, he was arguing against the social scientists who believe that you could come up with an absolutely neutral account of something. Just you know, take out any evaluative dimension whatsoever. Um, so part of those epistemological debates of the, of the uh, uh, six, late 60s or early 70s, um, but I, uh, that hit me because I realized that there's something in style, in prose, uh, that can position your reader uh, any number of ways, morally speaking, ethically speaking. Um, you know, your attitude toward a character, your uh, your approach to an event. Um, is the author uh, trying to generate an empathic response, or do you feel as if you're being had? I mean, you know, that you're... That the, that the writer is really um, uh, trying to get you to work yourself up into a ladder and then pull the rug out from under you. So uh, you have to, you know, you make those decisions, or at least I do, rather early on. You know, is this, is, is this going to be something that gets deeper and more reflective, or uh, is this going to be one of those things when you put it down and say, well, it probably wasn't worth it? You know, probably wasn't worth the time. Um, so that, for example, the mystery writers that I love to read, that that's the way I've gone the last few years. I've decided that mystery writers are the the greatest moral philosophers of our time. Um, because they they really do understand that there's evil in the world and uh, they really do understand that their capacity to uh, to deal with it is limited. Uh, and they really do understand they have to persevere nonetheless, even though it's a kind of focused task. Um, so it's a, it's a fascinating uh, genre and attracts many women. There are many great women mystery writers. And I'm not thinking of Agatha Christie. I'm thinking of uh, P.D. James, for example, who I think you could call a moral philosopher of sorts. Um, and one of the things that that said to me is that you, you know, you don't have to cast your prose in the language of the academy um, in order to offer a moral, philosophical account of something. You know, that it can come in the form of, you know, the detective story or the mystery story or the murder mystery, however you want to phrase that, or in some other form. Yes, one of my favorite. Uh crime writers is uh, Ross McDonald, yeah. and yeah. he um, he actually uh, took a PhD, he studied under W.H. Auden, and he wrote his dissertation on Coleridge, but but he uh, he made his living as a, as a writer of, of mysteries or crime fiction, and 
he, he had a phrase that makes me think of you. He, he, he talked about democratic probes. Mm -hmm. And he said that there was something about a convention that is known to all members of the society, written in a language that's primarily shaped by the spoken language. Uh, uh, it's not, of course, no writing is actually a copy of the way we speak. That would not be a lot of fun uh, to read. But it's all writing is shaped by conventions. But And, and in fact, McDonald himself compared uh, the mystery novel to a sonnet. He said they're, you know, they're equally stylized, but it's a convention that is well known yeah. to all members of the society and that it can be used for the the purposes of democratic prose. Yes, yes. And what and what I agree. Uh, what's interesting about this is the fact that um, if we look at the big category of literature, uh, the mystery writers are so often looked down upon. They're not serious novelists, you know. Genre fiction. That's right. Uh, so it's and, and that that uh, always tends to vex me because. Um, yeah. the, first of all, because there's a deep seriousness of purpose uh, with not all, but most of the people who apply the trade. Um, the the writing, as in writing in any other genre, is good or good or not so good or really wonderful. Um, so you make judgments about the writing. And P.D. James, for example, is a wonderful writer. In addition to being a a kind of moral philosopher had been deeply shaped by the English Book of Common Prayer, um, and her prose reflects that. Um, and yet it's sort of, the stick up our noses at it, because it isn't the really deep stuff. You know, it's, it's sort of the way um, uh, huge popular cinematic hits uh, that, that, the pe that the people really want to see and, and go to never get rarely get nominated for the Academy Award, you know, they're, they're too, like the, Bat, the Batman uh, movie. Right. Hopefully, hopefully it will get nominated this time, too. I mean, brilliant explorations of evil and, and, and darkness, and yet the need to uh, need to combat it um, and to keep the live alternatives to it, so. Yeah, so what you say about Th these uh, popular works yeah. reminds me of what you mentioned earlier that Flannery O'Connor said about, yes. about writing and, and uh, it seems to me that one of the moral choices that you've made as a writer that is somewhat against the current of the time, that is the current in, in the higher yeah. intellectual spheres uh, and that current is what you might call a contempt for the quotidian. Um, and it shows up in, in many different forms. So that, for instance, there's a wonderful story that uh, the poet uh, Cheswa Miłosz told of being at a cocktail party. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, they're in someone's apartment and they're high up and he's, he's uh, standing next to a Marcuse and um, they're looking out the window and uh, Marcuse points out to the city and says to him, we're surrounded by animals. Mm -hmm. And so there's this sense of um, the infinite distance between, between these sophisticated people who understand how the world really works and they're, they're up in their high rise and they're looking down. Uh, but, it, but it shows up in many other forms in our in our time. And those lowly for life forms down there called <laughs> humans. Yeah. And and your the whole current of your work is is strongly against that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In fact, I have my own Nilo story to tell you. Um, th this was at an event in Boston, and I happened. To, you know who Nilo was? The great. Polish uh, writer, poet, won the Nobel Prize, um, and it really does uh, uh, capture the quotidian in his poetry. He's a wonderful uh, poet, and he, uh, I learned a few things about him. He, he, he always drinks, or did, uh, precisely three drinks, and then stops. But before he's going to have a conversation, he needs these three drinks. <laughs> uh, Polish vodka. I it's, forgot to have. I'm sorry. A certain temperature, um, and it, you know, say just you know, 
give me a few moments, and he has his three dreams, <laughs> and it stops, and then you have a conversation. But one of the things he talked about was the fact that uh, he wrote one of the, the best books um, about uh, totalitarianism called The Captive Mind. And it was a book that, that entered into, um, and writers have no control over this, but entered into controversy surrounding the Cold War. Uh, this was after the defeat of the Nazis, but it was, it, you know, you still had the Soviet <coughs> Russia um, and the Soviet Union. And that's the place that Nimosh himself had fled. Um, so he was telling me that they told him at Berkeley uh, that they, where he was teaching, that they'd given him tenure despite the fact that he'd written uh, The Captive Mind. Um, because, uh, you know, the political correctness had already started to seep in, and somehow you weren't, su weren't supposed to criticize anything on the, uh, the left, allegedly. I don't know what, what's left wing about Soviet totalitarianism, but at any rate, um, he. Uh, he thought that was, he, and he joked about that. And then I asked him some questions about uh, philosophy of the 20th century, and we were still in it uh, on that occasion. Um, I said, well, who, who are the philosophers who will be remembered? And he said, oh, I think, I think the, uh, the, the greatest philosopher who will be held up as an example is, is Jean-Paul Sartre. And I said, I knew he couldn't mean that. <laughs> so I, 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 said, I said, really? And he kind of chuckled and then said, yes, as an aberration. <laughs> so uh, I think mean, that was his way of, again, of just his distancing himself from uh, the philosopher who distances himself from ordinary uh, humanity. Um, and is interested only in the great world historic figures and so forth. Yeah, I, I think of a couple of currents of your work that connect with that, and one is that um, the work that uh, you've done on uh, women and what would now be called women's studies, um, and, but also the attention that you've paid to uh, children yeah. and um, the disabled, and um, against the autonomous nor who usually is implicitly male. <laughs> Could you say a little bit about how that progressed in your work? Yeah. Well, it's, it's one of those things you either choose to pay attention to or you don't um, about yourself. Um, and, you know, you, uh, you discover one day that you're female and, and, uh, and you decide that this is, this is not just a biological statement, that there's, there's a whole lot more to say about that. And um, certainly in the time in which I was going to college and so forth, there was a lot of, especially graduate school, a lot of ferment around these questions. So on the one hand, I, I was swept up in that, but on the other, I didn't like a whole lot of what I was hearing mm -hmm. from um, some of the, the feminists, the radical feminists, uh, and so forth. Um, in part because they ran directly counter to uh, some of the things that deep in my bones I knew to be true about, about uh, children and what children need in order to uh, be, be loved and cared for and secure and so forth, and that one could not treat them, you know, blindly um, or pay uh, insufficient attention to them. So uh, it struck me there was a weird paradox in saying we need to pay more attention to women, we need to pay more attention to women, but so many of the the, the feminists at the time were not paying, then didn't pay any attention to children. It's like you know, someone has to not be paid attention to almost in order that we can move forward and gain our gain our goals. Um, I'm not going to go over. I've written about this. It's in my book. So if anyone wants to read the story, they can read the story. But um, but I didn't think it was um, you know that you you made social change on the backs of the weaker members of your society, whether it's it's children or 
people with disabilities and so forth. Um, I remember being at a, a meeting, this would have been in the 70s, uh, of a, a group um, that was, oh gosh, what did they call themselves? The uh, Eastern something conference of Marxist philosophers, I'm not sure. At any, at any rate, I was, I was in attendance and uh, this one fellow was putting forward um, a plan for a future utopia where, he didn't call it that, but that's really what it was, um, where everything would be worked out very neatly and all the necessary work would get done and everyone would be happy and you, you just fill in the blanks. Um, but then I, I asked him, well, who would do, as at one point he had talked about the uh, please forgive my speech, but this is what he said, shit work. Um, who's going to, so sorry, you never heard me say that. Um, who's, going, who's going to do, you know, those kinds of jobs, the, the garbage collector, the, um, you know, the person who has to clean up dangerous, toxic sites, because that was very much in the news at the time. And he had an answer for that, and it was ready to hand for him. And it was, oh, he said, well, well, we can just take prisoners out of jail and, you know, and um, Down syndrome people could probably do that. And, you know, so you grab, you grab the just people who are uh, under control or, 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 yeah. or are just disabled but capable of going in and cleaning out a hot site and so on. So that was his solution, you know, to the issue of who, uh, how is some of the work that most people don't want to do, how does that get done? Um, and what surprised me was that uh, most people didn't seem horrified by, by his response. And I think it was because they were so enthralled to, you know, an ideology that he just circle the wagon conceptually and things fall away and you don't pay attention to them. It's, it's like uh, Milan Kundera's discussion and the uh, unbearable lightness of me, yeah, yeah, where you have the chorus of the angels, right? Is it, or the dance of the angels, uh, dancing in a circle, holding hands, and you don't want to be outside the circle, no. you want to be in it. So you have to, you keep going along, uh, even though you think this is, this is palpably wrong, this is terrible, but you don't want to be outside the circle um, because bad things happen to people who are outside the circle. That story reminds me of a time when I was riding with you to a conference. I don't remember. It was one of Michael Cromarty's conferences, and we were jammed into the back oh, right. of a van. And and you were commenting um, about um, the Catholic Church and how you, there was a lot that you found attractive, yeah. to it, but that you probably would never become Catholic because you fear it was too semi-Pelagian. And, and semi-Pelagian in your, in your writerly vocabulary is a really bad thing. Could you explain to us why why that's a bad thing? Semi-Pelagian? Yeah. Uh, I, I think I was wrong about Catholicism on that. Um, but um, Pelagian is, well, I don't have to explain it to the people in this room, probably. But um, rough and ready way of thinking about it is uh, that you, you know through your own effort uh, you can achieve um, uh, salvation. Let's say forms of salvation. Uh, you can uh, the, 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 let me period. Let me start another way. That um, there are no intrinsic barriers to the achievement of some good. Um, in other words, that our wills are not torn in the way Augustine says our wills are torn and St. Paul as well. Uh, but, you know, rather we can find clear pathways to, to an estimable endpoint. Utopia or something yeah, like yeah. it. And it was, again, the, also it conjured up an image of the, of the self Alone, sort of carrying on. Uh, that's that's what I had in mind. I, whether I was being fair, courageous or not, I don't know. But um, but that's what I was thinking of. Well, that that crops up again and again in your writing that um, 
reminding us of our limitations. Yes. And um, that came up in your comment yeah. in uh, our discussion just before yeah. lunch as well, that, that if we set some impossible standard yeah. to compare ourselves yeah. to, and um, so it seems like what you try to do is hold that sort of chase and realism yeah. in tension with the the moral claims that are non-negotiable. We can't just say, oh, well, then we yeah. don't really have to bother because right. we're all so fallible. And right, right. Um, I, yeah, I think there's a, it, it's a, a terrific problem and issue, but it's, uh, or a number, a series of issues. Um, part of just being human, I think, in a certain way. Um, you know, how do you, how do you keep yourself from flying away you know, into some utopian fantasy? On the one hand, having children is yeah, that that that's a pretty good way to do it. Um, how do you stop that, chasing that? Uh, but you don't want to go so far that you you say, oh, I, nothing's going to ever make a difference, and you just you know retreat. Um, so how do you how do you balance that recognition um, and at the same time keep hope? Uh, alive to generate a coin phrase um, and uh, and enliven and, and enliven your own life and the life of the society more generally, which can't be a solo effort, but others participating in it, so that you are able to act in the world and are able to do things. So it's, it's this complex balance to be attained, and I, I think it's impossible to do it perfectly. <laughs> Um, and that's why there are periods of where people are often very active, and then they retreat for a time, and then they come back, and then they, you know, um, and it's quite it's quite understandable because it's uh, the the public uh, the public the glare of the public and of publicity is uh, uh, can can be not so much illuminating as just uh, destructive. I want to conclude with an aspect of your writing that probably not everyone in this room is aware of, even though you probably have some of your best readers around these yeah, uh, tables here. But apart from all the other things you've done, you've, you've written some wonderful pieces about movies. Um, I know that because some of them you've written for Books and Culture, but you've also written for The New Republic and other places about movies as well. You love movies. That's another democratic form, right, exactly. if you will. And if you could talk, art for yeah, talk a little bit about um, your your uh, writing for movies, your passion for movies, uh, um, how, how what you think of movies, what they bring to us distinctively. Yeah. Well, I, first of all, I just want to thank John for um, to do this publicly um, and appropriately. So for uh, giving me space to send those movie things I do to you once in a while. Um, I don't know how many I've done now, four, maybe five? Uh, five or six. Five yeah. or six, something like that. Um, about particular films, um, or one of them was really a, a kind of musing on the, uh, on the I I iconic effect of certain movie stars. I think Johnny Depp was my case in point. Yes, you expressed great affection for Johnny Depp. <laughs> <laughs> I, think I, I think I did. It was Chasen. <laughs> the uh, well, first of all, one just has to acknowledge the power of of of, of the image, um, vi visual power, and how it can so economically convey something that it would take two pages of writing to convey. You know, through through a, um, a squint. You know, through um, a, a moment when you know a character on the screen, um, when his or her eyes you know make a certain movement or the mouth, the lips part a bit, and no word is spoken. So much that can be that can be conveyed in that way without words, and I, that's a frightening thing for people who traffic in words. Um, so I think that's one reason that uh, movies often are again. It, it's sort of second grade, yeah. Why mess with that kind of stuff? Um, you're not really teaching anything if you have put movies in your 
classes. That hasn't happened here, but I, my uh, first teaching stint, 15 years at the University of Massachusetts, and then seven years at Vanderbilt, I got that kind of feedback, to be use a friendly term, from uh, some of my colleagues, you know, well, that's not really teaching. That's, uh, but it seemed to me that one needs to explore what these films say and how they say it and what they do. And I got, I'm not quite sure um, how I got bitten by the movie bug, but um, the little village I grew up in didn't have a movie theater. And the, the nearest theater was about 10 miles away in Fort Collins, Colorado, which was the big metropolis, about 7,000 people uh, there. And I cajoled my mother. Um, who was working at Montgomery Ward on Saturdays to enhance the pretty meager family income. So I would uh, try to be a good girl all week. And then I could I could go with her to town and uh, have my quarter or whatever it was and go to a matinee. Um, and fortunately, my parents paid no attention to movies. So... Um, I remember the occasion when I was going to go see On the Waterfront. And uh, my mom said, oh, what is that film about? And I said, oh, uh, 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 a family in a fishing, you know, this, this fishing village on the waterfront. Because um, I, I knew if I explained to her that it was this tough film and, you know, Marlon Brando and so on, that that was it. I, I wasn't going to get to see On the Waterfront. So, um, so it's, 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 you know, Happy farm, a happy fishing family. <laughs> and a fishing village. Um, and I, I'm sorry I took to my mom, but I, I'm not sorry that I saw the film. It's, you know, it's one of the great, great works, obviously, by Lady Kazan. Um, so it was, you know, I had to be sly um, to get to see a lot of the movies that I wanted to, wanted to see. But that, once it starts, if you're really a movie fan, it's, you're, you're a movie fan. It's a lifelong affair. Yeah, it, it is. Yeah, it is. Well, thank you so much for this conversation, thank Jane. You. And thank you all. Thanks. We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School.